Yeah. Well, it's funny. I was talking to a, a, a dear friend the other day who, who, you know, she suffers from depression quite a bit. And what I know about depression is that it's actually a game of inches, not a game of miles. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is that it doesn't take, you know, like there, there, there's sort of the mood component, which is how am I feeling right now in this moment? And if, you know, if there's a, some suicidal ideation or something happening in this moment, like to actually get your brain out of that. And that's entirely internally generated, you know, and, and in my darkest moments, what I learned how to do was it was really stupid and simple, but it was find one or two or three things to appreciate right now. And it's amazing how little my brain wanted to do that. You know, my brain just said, no, no, no. I want to continue to worry and obsess and be pissed off. But, you know, instead I would say, well, the sky is a lovely shade of blue. You know, something really simple like that. Or, I, you know, somebody smiled at me today and that felt good. You know, like, and just those little moments were just enough. Because it's to me, it's about a trend line. You know, sort of, it's almost like, you know, like you investing in a stock. You know, like I want my stock to kind of continually rise. I don't care what dollar value it is right now, but I just want it to be kind of going up and to the right even if it's, that's a slight up and to the right. And the same is true of my mood. Like, I just want my mood to be better now than I was a few minutes ago. Then, you know, that's amazing. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. With RX Bars, what you see is what you get. But uh, since you can't see one right now, enjoy this vivid description. 12 grams of protein made from real, simple food. Then sprinkle sea salt crystals on top of decadent chocolate. And that's a chocolate sea salt RX bar. Now picture yourself going to rxbar.com to see all our other protein bar flavors. RX bar. Simple. Good. Today, more than ever, it's essential that we're making the right decisions to keep our bodies healthy, to help us be resilient, live better, or simply take on whatever the day may bring. But we're overloaded with nutritional information, leaving us with more questions than answers. Does that even work? Can I trust it? Will that work for me and my goals? How do you know what your body uniquely needs unless you ask it? Well, for the truth seekers, the change makers, and the goal getters, the answers are inside you. Inside Tracker is the ultra personalized nutrition platform that analyzes your blood and DNA biomarkers along with your lifestyle habits to help you optimize your body and reach your goals. Inside Tracker's patented system will transform your body's data into knowledge, insights, and a customized action plan of science backed recommendations. Are you ready to take control of your health and wellness journey? Unlock the power of your potential with Inside Tracker. Get 25% off today at insidetracker.com slash listen. Bob and Alex, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. We're so, so excited. Happy to be here. Thanks. Yeah, well, you have both been guests, uh, both at different times on the Unmistakable Creative. Alex, uh, we talked to you about food, and Bob, I talked to you about the psychology of cults, which was probably one of my favorite conversations we've ever had in 700 episodes. Uh, but before we get into what you guys are up to now and, and what we're here to talk about today, I want to start by asking you, what did your parents do for a living? And what impact has that ended up having on the choices that you've both have made with your life and your careers? Sure. Um, well, mom was a teacher because that was what, you know, women of her generation did. She was born in 1930. My parents, I, I'm a sort of a Gen X, um, but my parents had me rather late in life. So they're actually were the World War II slash depression babies. Um, so there was kind of a generational, a generation skipped in my family. Um, so yeah, so my mother was, a, was a school teacher part-time while I was growing up and a housewife. And my dad, uh, was a ceramic engineer and then he eventually became a salesperson. And I think what influenced me a lot is that my dad was, a he was, he was born quite poor in coastal North Carolina. One of the first in his family to go to college, he went on the GI bill after the second world war and his first love was history. And his second love was crystallography. But he went into ceramic engineering because it was a guaranteed placement in a, in a well-paying job. And I think a lot of my career, the early part of my career was a rebelling against that <clears throat> and only doing what I loved. And the latter part of my career has been like, I should figure out how to earn a living as well as do what I love and kind of emerging of those two things. So, yeah. Yeah. 
And my father was, uh, he actually says he had a calling to go into education. He was a high school teacher for a long time, and he was always really drawn to the quote unquote bad kids. You know, he, he would start like after school programs and kind of last stop uh, special programs in high school for the kids who were like ready to go to juvie. And then he was a high school principal for 25 years. So he was always just really dedicated to the work. He was like, you know, edu- helping kids get a good education is what I'm all about. Um, it was actually the teachers and the parents that were harder for him to deal with over the years. And then my mom was an artist and a teacher and a master organic gardener. And they were both clear from day one, do what you love, follow your passion, we'll support you no matter what, you know, be smart about it. Like, don't just don't fritter away your time, but really like find out what you love and the money will follow. So I have done a lot of different things. Actually, you have too. We've both had a lot of careers (laughs) (laughs) and it's only in the last, I would say, you know, well, for me, it's been about 15 years for you, it's been a little bit shorter than that. That you, but your your focus has been incredible, and it always changes too. My career does. I mean, just in the last year, it's changed dramatically yeah. in terms of like what I do day to day. So it's interesting because Alex, you have this narrative of do what you love and, and follow your passion, and, and the money will follow. And Bob, you had a, a dad who basically chose to go do something that was secure, guaranteed to work. And yet, we live in a world of diminishing permanence where nothing is guaranteed anymore. There's no such thing as a job for life. So, mm-hmm. I guess the question is, how do you reconcile those two things and function uh, in society today? I think my whole life has been trying to reconcile those things. I mean, my, my dad, while he was very supportive of us going off and following our passions, he was in the same career for his entire career. He worked in public schools in Oregon. He was at the same school as a principal for 25 years. That's almost unheard of. They usually move every two to three years. And then my mother was just, you know, all over the place with her work. So I've, I mean, I don't know how you do it, but I think my own career path, I've been a coach and mentor mainly for the last 15 plus years, but that has evolved constantly as well. So it is a a personal evolution while kind of staying on the same path as well. That was the, the, the great thing I took from my dad, actually, which is a part of his story, which I didn't, which I kind of glossed over, forgot about, is that when he was in his late 50s, early 60s, and I was entering college, he decided to start his own company. He actually left his very secure, lifelong career company he'd been with for like 20, 25 years, largely because they wanted him to move and he and he was committed to, you know, being in the neighborhood, you know, me having continuity in my life around friends and that kind of thing. And then, but he always, and my brother now runs that company uh, and my father's passed away, but one of the things my dad always said to me was about his, re- he retired well, he retired very comfortably, not, not as a, you know, multimillionaire or anything like that, but very comfortably. And he said he would never have done it if he hadn't started his own business, if he mm-hmm. hadn't taken control. And so there's something about the courage of doing that later in life, uh, which is something I think I've taken on. I'm actually 53 now and, and really fully independent in the, only in the last year for the first time in my career. And two, you know, just the, I, I don't know, just the idea of like, of, of being in control, of taking control, because as you say, nothing is permanent. And I think I'm now committed to this ride, which is, I don't know, you know, like what's going to come even next year, but I'm committed that something good is going to come. Like if you manage, I hate to say this language, but manage your brand, you know, like, which is really just about knowing people and having them think you're cool and think you're smart and think, and, and, and think you have integrity and want to work with you. And then figure out what they need and whether or not you can sell it to them and whether you you can provide it to them or or somebody else you know can. Yeah. Have there been periods for both of you uh, in your lives where there has been financial uncertainty? And if so, how did you navigate it without losing your mind? (laughs) Bob, you go. (laughs) I don't know that I did. Um, You know, uh, like, I I think we, we, we touched on this on our last conversation um, but about 10 years ago, I left what can be des- what could be described as a cultic organization. Uh, and at that time, I was in my mid-40s. I was actually flat broke, pretty much. I liquidated my, uh, my 401ks um, in order just to kind of pay rent um, about that time. I, was, I actually had bad credit. I had 
about $100,000 worth of student loans. And what I did was I actually made making money and, and kind of create, recreating my career the focus of everything. I think about the time I met Alex, it was about seven or eight years ago, I was writing down every penny that I spent, what it went to. I was analyzing myself thoroughly. And also, I think around the time where I was really broke and, and struggling, I actually did kind of lose my mind a little bit. I had what you could describe as a as something of a breakdown. Um, and uh, I, I got sober. Uh, I'm not, you know, I don't identify as an alcoholic, but for about three years, it was very, very useful for me not to have any kind of intoxicant entering my bloodstream. Um, I meditated every day and I made my focus just really listening to the world and saying, because I, everything I had done before then had been my own idea. This is what I should create. This is what the world needs. This is what the, th you know, this is the thing that, you know, and kind of forcing it on my potential customers. And what I started to do was really, really listen to what potential customers and potential collaborators valued from me, what they wanted from me. And I began to really take external cues, which is really in many ways, basic, you know, lean startup customer development philosophy, right? You, you listen to the market, you make offerings, you see how the response is and you iterate along the way. And I think, you know, for me, having a ton of discipline was really, really, really important. Um, and I, I would kind of went a little overboard on the discipline, but, um, and I don't do that now. I, I don't write down every penny now by, by long stretch. Um, but it, but I've kind of earned, earned the right not to. Hmm. And, you know, my folks divorced when I was 12 or so. And over the next 10 years, when I mainly lived with my mom, um, before, and then I went to college, you know, she, she was terrible with money. <laughs> God love her. But she went through bankruptcy twice. We lost our house. Um, I, to the, towards the end of when I was living with her in high school, like I was working as close to full time as I could get, you know, I was going to school full time. I was like school to pay for college is on me. Like I have to get loans and student aid and I'm making up the rest, you know, dad pitched in a little bit, but it was really on my shoulders. So, you know, from high school, I always felt like, okay, like dad's there a little bit to, you know, support me if I have a real emergency. Um, and, and most of the time I, I've, I've felt like I have to do it. Like I have to figure it out. And I've always had, I've always had this joke, like, you know, if I lose everything, as long as I have a minimum wage job and a library card, I'll be okay. Like I can, you know, I can live simply. I've lived in one room before I could go back to it and be fine. But it's interesting to grow up with that kind of insecurity going through bankruptcy and losing everything. And I still, you know, I still fight that, um, you know, that scarcity mentality that I had at a young age. Um, it sometimes still peaks up and many people outside of my brain would say that I'm quite successful, but inside my brain, there's always that voice. that's like, it could be gone at any moment. <laughs> still wakes us up in the middle of the night sometimes. Sometimes it does. Yeah. 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 So Bob, if I remember correctly from our last conversation, uh, you were telling me that things had gotten so bad that you were actually making plans for suicide. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 You know, like I think I, I've, I've had a sort of a lifelong sort of struggle with depression um, and mood, let's call it a mood imbalance, you know, just sort of like waking up in the morning and feeling like, man, life is terrible. Um, and I have a lot of friends who, who still struggle with that. I fortunately don't. Um, but there was a time period, and I actually it was actually really about a two day period um, during that time period, where you know you're in your mid forties, um, you know, and I, I I'd actually gone through I'd been through two three divorces um, at that point in my life, and was leaving this kind of crazy organization, and looking back over the two years that I'd been there, and kind of think, wondering what was I thinking, and I and I just sort of started to think like you know, maybe this is what I get. And if this is what I get, I don't really want it. And, and, you know, psychologists will tell you there's a big difference between sort of suicidal ideation, which we all, I think everybody can do, which is sort of like, oh man, I wish I could just check out. And it's just sort of like this, this, this kind of escapist kind of imagination and real suicide planning. And I sort of sl slipped over to the edge into where I was really planning. I was like, I, I had my method down. I had my time down. I was, I was sort of like, I, I had it all sort of mapped out. 
And then at the same time, I think that actually flipped me over into another kind of planning, which was, well, well, maybe this isn't everything I get, you know? And I, and I realized that I had a lot of assets, you know, I'm, you know, I've, I, I had a graduate degree at that time, so I have an MBA, um, which isn't nothing. I have uh, a family that, that supports me. I have friends that support me and friends that like me. And I've always known, you know, been told that, you know, I was pretty smart. I test well on tests. I do well in school. And I was like, well, okay, maybe I can take these assets and and turn them into something worth living. You know, it kind of, I began developing. So right while I was having this sort of strategic focus on taking my own life, you know, the sort of planning tactical focus on doing this, you know, kind of final thing, I was like, well, I can turn that same attention towards something else. And it, it was a, it was a real hit of humility where I realized, you know, kind of began to reiterate, like the, the best thinking I had had gotten me what I are, what I currently had. So I really needed to, needed to have new ways of thinking. And um, Alex and I, we did a course in positive psychology a few years ago. And one of the things they point out is that post-traumatic stress is this thing that we all know about and it's, and it's pretty well documented, but post-traumatic growth is equally well documented. And this idea that uh, a, a real moment of trauma and actually um, somebody you've had on the show, um, our friend Cerny Pillay mm-hmm. will talk about this, that it, that it actually, there's a, who's a, he's a neuroscientist and he talks about how trauma can actually overwhelm a certain part of our brain which allows it to actually, it, it, it promotes neuroplasticity essentially. And I think in the, over the next course of the next 10 years, um, my, uh, my depression almost completely evaporated. I rarely experience any, any bouts of that anymore. Um, and I remain pretty positive and hopeful and certainly all of the other, you know, I have a great relationship. I have, uh, you know, I live in a one, you know, great place and my bank account is fortunately, you know, on, on the upswing most of the time. With RX bars, what you see is what you get. But uh, since you can't see one right now, enjoy this vivid description. 12 grams of protein made from real, simple food. Then sprinkle sea salt crystals on top of decadent chocolate. And that's a chocolate sea salt RX bar. Now picture yourself going to rxbar.com to see all our other protein bar flavors. RX bar. Simple. Good. With the Home Depot, decorating your home is now easier than ever before. Start by heading to homedepot.com where you can shop for everything for every room. Browse thousands of furniture pieces and decorative accents to fit any style. Explore bedding and bath linens, kitchenware and small appliances, all at the right prices. Whether you're going for a brand new look or a seasonal refresh or simply a few finishing touches, the Home Depot has all of the pieces you need. And the best part? Shop today and you'll get free and flexible delivery with easy returns. Plus, for a limited time, you can save even more on the styles you love when you use the code UNMISTAKABLE10 at checkout. Find exactly what you're looking for and more at homedepot.com slash decor. Valid on select items online only. Free delivery on select items, $45 or more. Visit homedepot.com for more information. So COVID-19 has made all of our lives super complicated. It's changed so much from the way that we live to the way that we work. And there's so much information coming at us every day between news briefings and online articles. And if you have a family like mindful of doctors, even family Zoom chats. So figuring out what you're actually supposed to do in the workplace can be really overwhelming. Well, if you want to get safely back to work during COVID-19, there's an app for that. iAuditor by Safety Culture will help keep your coworkers and customers safe. It's a simple safety checklist and inspection app that anyone can learn within minutes. It allows you to do things like follow CDC guidelines, complete COVID-19 safety inspections, maintain an audit trail, and stay safe. There are hundreds of preloaded checklists available to download for free. iAuditor is the world's largest safety checklist app with more than 600 million checks completed per year. Visit safetyculture.com for your free checklist today. Again, visit safetyculture.com to download your free checklist today. So a couple of things come from this for me, and and these are questions for both of you. Uh, Bob, I guess one of the questions is, why, despite having things externally look relatively well, do we feel you know hopeless uh, at moments? And then how much of your ability to overcome depression has been the result of external circumstances changing and how much of it has been the result of internal changes? And Alex, for you, the question is, um, how does what we put into our body affect all of this? 
Mm. I would say those are real powerfully interlocking questions. Um, yeah, I, so the question is, is, is like what are the external circumstances and, and, and sort of the, yeah. how the connection. Like here's a perfect example. I just had a book come out, which is something that people dream of accomplishing. And I've probably been more depressed than I've been in a really long time. Mm. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I was talking to a, a, a dear friend the other day who, who, you know, she suffers from depression quite a bit. And what I know about depression is that it's actually a game of inches, not a game of miles. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is that it doesn't take, you know, like there, there, there's sort of the mood component, which is how am I feeling right now in this moment? And if, you know, if there's a, some suicidal ideation or something happening in this moment, like to actually get your brain out of that. And that's entirely internally generated, you know, and, and in my darkest moments, what I learned how to do was it was really stupid and simple, but it was find one or two or three things to appreciate right now. And it's amazing how little my brain wanted to do that. You know, my brain just said, no, no, no. I want to continue to worry and obsess and be pissed off. But, you know, instead I would say, well, the sky is a lovely shade of blue. You know, something really simple like that. Or, I, you know, somebody smiled at me today and that felt good. You know, like, and just those little moments were just enough. Because it's to me, it's about a trend line. You know, sort of, it's almost like, you know, like you investing in a stock, you know, like I want my stock to kind of continually rise. I don't care what dollar value it is right now, but I just want it to be kind of going up and to the right, even if that's a slight up and to the right. And the same is true of my mood. Like I just want my mood to be as long if I'm slightly better now than I was a few minutes ago, then, you know, that's amazing. But I think the other piece of it is, I think the last time actually, funny enough, that I had a really, a real bout of depression, it was triggered by Robin Williams taking his own life. And for some reason it hit me hard and it hit me, you know, like it, I identified with him in some way. And, and I remember we were staying at an apartment in Portland where we were, we were um, vacationing or seeing Alex's family and it just hit me really hard. And, you know, this is where the external piece comes in. I have an amazing partner, you know, and I've, I've, Cultiv you know, we've cultivated this relationship to, the, to where I know that she has my back and I know that I can bring that to her and say, hey, I'm feeling this right now. And she'll be like, oh, I'm sorry you're feeling that. And there's something about just having your, you know, like setting up your external circumstances really. And that I think maybe Alex can talk about food as well, but like, like setting up your external circumstances, like don't go get drunk with idiots, you know, when you're feeling bad, you know, don't indulge yourself, you know, like eat good food, go for a run, um, hang out with someone who loves you unconditionally, you know, or as unconditionally as you can find. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Shani, you know, I don't know if we talked about this before, but I actually have a, a family history of depression and suicide and prescription drug abuse. Um, my grandfather was a doctor and he would prescribe anything he wanted and my aunt wanted. And there's just a lot of, um, you know, mental illness on that side of the family. And it's interesting to watch how it plays out over generations. Um, I, I used to joke and I don't, I don't really say this anymore, but still there's truth to it. I just don't, it, it doesn't feel funny anymore. I think it was deflecting. I used to joke and say either, you know, in my family, you're either an alcoholic or a sugar addict. And I'm sure I'm glad I was a sugar addict instead. Um, but the, the damage from food, you know, food is a drug. You can take it to heal and you can eat it to damage, or you can eat it kind of unknowingly and do damage or heal. And I know in my own life, in my mid twenties, um, you know, part of my own healing journey was that I got really, really sick in my mid twenties and it was mostly food induced, but it was kicked off by a lot of antibiotic, uh, prescriptions <laughs> over the course of about five years. And the sugar and the caffeine that I was consuming just in handfuls every day, I mean, so much refined sugar in my body. I was exhausted, depressed. I mean, really depressed. I would sleep all weekend, still would be exhausted Monday morning. I had migraine headaches almost every day. It was just horrendous. And what got me out of that was cutting out sugar and cutting out refined foods and getting away from caffeine. And it was remarkable how quickly I felt better it was a tough road. I mean, this was back in 99 and 2000. People didn't, you know, people weren't so as familiar 
with refined sugar and its effects and with candida and yeast overgrowth and the gut microbiome and all these things that are now, you know, on the top of mind for a lot of people. But, you know, I can see that my own sugar addiction, which started at a really young age, um, became my drug of choice, helped me get through hard times. I joke that you know, during my divorce, I would have a threesome every night on the couch with Ben and Jerry. They were my boyfriends. And, you know, like a lot of people, we can use food to get through things. We can use drug to get through things. But we we do know a lot more about food's effects. So, you know, if that's, if you really want to feel good, and I've, I've seen it with Bob, I've seen it with myself. I see it in our son, who's 11 year old, you know, when you really, you know, you feel differently when you eat broccoli and salmon Mm. than when you eat a Diet Coke and Doritos. Yeah, definitely. Like you can just imagine how you're going to feel in a half an hour after that. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So I I didn't know you had a son and uh, I I wanted to ask based on on both your perspectives uh, in terms of the stories that you were taught about money growing up, the fact that your dad is an educator and given the work that you do, uh, what impact and, and how has that informed uh, the way that you're being a parent? And what would you tell parents who are listening? Mm. Oh my gosh. So many ways. Well, actually, one of the things that we've been talking a lot about lately is boundaries. That's exactly where I was going to go. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And <clears throat> I learned from my dad because he was such, I mean, he wasn't a, a disciplinarian in a super scary way, but he was a high school principal and you knew the rules and you knew the repercussions for going outside of the rules. And it was just very consistent. It wasn't aggressively mean. It was just clear. And Bob gave me the most wonderful compliment in the last couple of weeks. He's like, your boundaries are incredibly strong. I've learned so much from you about having boundaries. And, you know, I, I feel like my son I'm totally biased here, but I think he's a joy to be around. Like he's a really cool kid and he doesn't act out a lot. And I think part of that is I have handed down this lineage of boundaries. (laughs) Like it's just very clear what the rules are. He gets a lot of freedom in some ways. He can self-express in a lot of ways. And I just don't tolerate bullshit. Like I just don't you know, and I get that from both of my parents. I mean, Bob and I were both raised by Southerners. So there's a lot of, you know, BS detecting going on. (laughs) Like, but, um, but having clear boundaries and explaining them and just being super consistent with them in every area from how you eat to bedtime, to how you treat other people, how you treat yourself, et cetera. I mean, I wish I had had a clear conversation about that when I was a kid, even though it was being demonstrated to me. Yeah. And what's so beautiful about the way you express boundaries, and I think what I've learned from you and, and hopefully what, what I embody now as well, is that boundaries aren't, there's no petulance in it. There's no like, like f- there's no anger and there's no firm, you know, like there's not, it's not like you are, you cannot do this. You can't, you know, like there's no, it's really just like, this is what's happening and this is not what's happening. And you can have whatever reaction you want to have to that. And so like I always say, when I first met Alex, you know, I became, you know, I had very unhealthy patterns in relationships. I I would swing from, you know, I was all about passion and, you know, I would, I had had, you know, partners in the past who, where we we would constantly break up and get back together again and kind of use it as a way to kickstart passion in the relationship. And I had some still some subtle habits around that when I met Alex and I realized early on nothing through nothing she said specifically, but that she wouldn't tolerate that. that, you know, like I could go ahead and do that, but she probably wouldn't be around. And so it really, it, it, you know, her having a clear boundary allowed me to know how to play with her. And it actually forced me to become a better human being, I think, and kind of, and, and grow as a person in order, because I wanted her in my life. And I was like, okay, this, now I got to like, you know, show the F up, you know, and, 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 and really be here. And you do the same, you know, with your son where, you know, it's bedtime now, or, or you're going to Union Square to pick up worms for your for uh, your lizard for your lizard <laughs> i'm not taking an hour out of my day to do that you're gonna even though you've never been on the subway by yourself before you're 11 and it's time and you can do this you know and there's like and, and he you know there was no option you know he had no emotional option to get out of that there was no room for negotiation it was just like this is what's happening mm-hmm. and he gets along you know and he's and for god bless him you know he's like okay i'll go do it hey it's srini 
I wanted to tell you about our new online course called Distraction Mastery. In this course, you'll learn exactly how to eliminate time-robbing distractions, master your attention, and get in the zone on command. In under 10 minutes a day, you'll learn a proven, powerful framework for killing distractions and developing unshakable focus based on proven research and experience. These are the exact strategies that I've personally used to write two books and hundreds of articles. So to learn more, visit courses.unmistakablecreative.com. Again, that's courses.unmistakablecreative.com. It's interesting. I, I'm thinking about boundaries, and this is something I thought about, a lot about over the last couple of years. And I, like some friend of mine from college asked me if I wanted to participate in some reality show on Netflix, uh, which was about relationships. I was like, yeah, okay, why not? What the hell? I mean, and so I was filling out their application. And one of the things was, would you be willing to relocate for somebody uh, that you've met? And I said, actually, no, I wouldn't. Uh, I'm an avid surfer. This is a huge part of my life, and it's not negotiable. So, yeah. Well, I, I think that makes a, a really perfect segue to talk about why you guys are actually here. Um, and that is this idea of getting to hell yes. So one, where did this whole idea emerge from? And then let's actually start getting into the framework. I know you kind of touched on boundaries, but I, I got to go through it this morning. And uh, let's start with, you know, where did this come from? Yeah, I mean, a, a few years ago, um, Alex and I experimented for a little while. We had we had we wanted to teach a couple of workshops. Uh, I think we talked like talk like three of them, um, and the and the focus was was couples and communication, and and uh, it was some stuff that we had learned in our relationship that we wanted to kind of workshop and test and 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 see. They weren't you know they, they weren't massively marketed workshops. I think we had about ten couples in each. But one of the things we realized early on was that people were actually coming to the workshop with wildly differing expectations. And that in order, in, before we could even get into the content of the workshop, we actually had to help them m at least have empathy for each other about why they were there. About you know, so you know, like if, you know, you know, triggering it can be like your partner asks you, "I want to go do this workshop to improve our relationship." You know, so one person is arriving full of fear, and the other is arriving full of hope. Um, it is it's maybe one dichotomy. So we developed this this conversation. Is actually it was adapted out of something that I had learned a few years before from a, a dating coach. Um, that we tweaked it and changed it a bit. Um, and we taught it for the workshop and we thought it was great. And then we started using it in our relationship um, just to discuss things that weren't even, you know, that we were like, we were be going to see my family, uh, which, you know, frankly can be a little bit stressful. And we were, and we were like, well, let's have this, con let's have the conversation about that. Why are we doing this? And it's really kind of about the why and, and aligning the two people or more people behind something. Um, and then I began teaching it to, I was working with teams of consultants. We were doing pretty large scale change programs, um, at really big companies sometimes with, with, um, with executives very high up in these companies. And I realized that both the consultants needed to do this because we needed to be a strong team as a team of consultants and present on the unified phase. And also the teams of executives would benefit because they were leading this big change program that was sometimes quite risky. Um, and I just started, it's just started feeding its way into our life. And then it became this kind of foundational thing. It actually took us a really long time to realize that we should make a product out of it. <laughs> we, were, we just thought this was like this useful thing that we did. And it took us a really, really, really long time. I feel like. Well, we kept getting people who took the workshop or we would, I was teaching it to friends and I was teaching it to my clients and people kept emailing both of us, texting both of us, reaching out to us over and over again. What was that four part thing again? How did that go? Will you re wait, take me through it again real quick. In fact, Bob was re-explaining it to a friend while he was in the back of a taxi. And by the time he was done re-explaining it, to the guy on the phone and hung up, the taxi driver said, Hey man, that was great. I really learned a lot from that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we were like, maybe we're onto something. And, you know, again, I, I, you know, the book we started to write it last summer, not this past summer, but, but over a year ago, really it was going to be kind of a Google doc, something we could just direct people to because we were just tired of explaining it. And then as we wrote it out, it actually morphed three or four times. Um, and, and we realized, oh, we probably have a product here. Let's give it a try. Let's see what it's about. Uh, and, I, and frankly, the more, you know, like we're, we're offering this for free, by the way. This is like a, a, it's a free resource where, you know, we'd love to people to really like it and, and maybe, you know, build a, an email list or something around it. But, but really, it's just something we just want to get out there and see how the world responds to. I just want it to be in as many people's hands as possible. Mm. And um, as we go through this, we're actually really close to launch right now. We are, like, I just had to finish the website for the book. We just got the printed books in our hands yesterday, and um, all of the extras are done as of today. 
And I'm just, you know, I think this, I mean, I don't want to like toot our own horn, but I think this might be really revolutionary or really, really, really valuable. So I'm super excited about it. I'm very proud of what we created. And Srini, actually, you know, talking with you about your book and this latest book that's out for you, you know, we did, we talked quite a bit, like, do we, you know, we both published books. I've written four books with traditional publishers and like, should we try to pitch this? Should we try to get a proposal out there? And I was like, hell no, dude, it is it'll take two more years and we'll have to fluff it up to 300 plus pages. You know, we've got this down to a a single tool. It's like, you know, an hour read for people. Like you can start using it right away. And we just wanted to get it out there. It was like, I do not want to take three years and (laughs) puff it up into this ginormous thing. It doesn't need to be. Well, let's do this. Uh, let's get into the actual framework. But Bob, I, I couldn't help but uh, notice something you said when you told me where you learned it from. You said that it was from a dating coach. Uh, yeah. That struck me in particular. One, I, I want to talk about the experience that you had working with him and, and how this came into play there. Uh, I only know because I worked with a dating coach and not only that, then I had him as a guest on The Unmistakable Creative. And he said, you'd be amazed how many people don't who, who are clients of his who don't even want people to know that uh, – they, they had worked with him despite the fact that they got extraordinary changes in their lives. Yeah. Well, I should clarify not, I have actually, if I had worked, if I had been a client of a dating coach, I would be more, more, you know, I, I hell I'm open that I was part of a, essentially a, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, I'm not, I don't have boundaries around this, but this, this dating coach was actually a client of mine. I was helping her with a little bit of marketing. Mm. And while along the way, she introduced me to this one thing that, that this kind of, um, you know, the, this, this tool she had, she was working mostly with people sort of in middle age or a little bit later in life who are really looking for the one and the partner. And so this, you know, this conversation sort of, sort of had its origins, um, you know, with, with what she recommended people talk about on a first date, you know, like just, just to not waste any, any time. Yeah. Yeah. So let's get into this. Uh, you know, you guys broke it up into this four part framework, intentions, concerns, boundaries, and dreams. So I guess, where do we begin? You know, when we, we talk about this idea of intentions, I mean, that can be defined in so many different ways for so many people. So how do we get, uh, how do we get them out on the table, I guess, in a way that is productive for both people in a conversation or in any situation? I want to frame this first. Like this is a really it's been pointed out to us. This is an incredibly efficient way to get into an important conversation with pretty much anyone. We have yet to find a topic that this doesn't work for or a setting. Uh-huh. So it's a really efficient way for me. I used to be very, I got really stressed out thinking about having a big conversation with someone, you know, I was like, how do you approach it? Where is it going to go? We have to talk. We have to talk. That's the worst way (laughs) to introduce somebody to a conversation or to get them to talk. In my mind, the moment I hear those, those words, I'm like, you know what? No, we don't. You can just dump me now and save ourselves. (laughs) Like literally that has been the end of every time in my life I've heard those words. Like it just, like, I know that feeling. I, I know where it's going to end. And I literally thought to myself, next time I get one of those texts that says, can you talk? I'm going to say, no, I just prefer you dump me over text so we can avoid this shit. Yeah. Just ghost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. And I, and I think also the first thing, you know, I, I, th- I guess I, I will refine one thing that Alex said. I think the one place that this doesn't really work or it needs to be dramatically refined is that if you're in a, in a very adversarial situation, mm-hmm. And if, if anybody in the conversation has a very strong zero sum perspective, like I need, you know, like in order for me to get what I want, someone else has to not get what they want. Um, so if you're, you know, like that's probably not, that's not the, the frame of mind that works in this conversation. This conversation is for people that authentically want to generate win-wins and, and at least think it might be possible. You don't have to believe hundred percent that it's going to be possible, but you have to kind of come in. If you're, if you're in a more adversarial situation, there's other resources I would recommend. Um, but getting into the intentions, which is really where we start, um, once we've agreed on the topic about what we're talking about, why we're talking about it, we talk about our intentions. And intentions, the way we use it, is really it's about your personal why, um, which is very, very connected to your personal values. As a matter of fact, we're thinking we, we might add like we actually a, uh, another podcast we were on. He has a values worksheet. We're like, oh, that might be a really useful thing to do before you do this. To serve people to understand their values. And so like when I do things, I do things because I learn something, because I have fun, because I get to hang out with people that I like uh, and because I like to get paid. And from those sort of four items, you can sort of 
figure out what I value. I value learning, you know, continuous learning. I value pleasure and fun. Um, I value relationships and people. Um, and I certainly like to pay the bills and, 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 uh, and, and make some cash. Um, and so it's really the, the intentions don't have to be a big, long conversation. That said, I have had people deliver kind of long monologues about only I actually one had one guy to deliver a, a monologue about his childhood uh, before he got into it the other day. And it really made sense based on his childhood and based on the idea that his home felt unsafe, um, that he spent all this time in nature. And we were doing a project that, that involved the environment and, and, and sort of uh, environmental protection kind of thing. Uh, and so he had to really get in, he, he had to really go deep and it was so moving to hear that. Um, but really that's the intentions are really just, why do you do this? Not what do you hope is going to happen? We're going to get to that later. And often when you ask people why they're doing this, they leap into hope, they leap into dreams, they leap into their desires. And that's really not necessarily hopeful. That's not necessarily helpful in the beginning. In the beginning, we just want to have a little bit of empathy for, um, you know, I'm doing this for this reasons and you're doing it. We're doing, we're doing the same thing, but maybe for other reasons, mm -hmm. like we're going on vacation. You want to have adventure and I want to have relaxation. Okay. So now we know <laughs> <laughs> same thing, different intention. We're going to have to do some reconciliation of those things that we're both going to win. Yeah. So you brought up concerns as the next piece of this. And you said concerns are things we fear that might keep this experience from going well. And I think in so many cases, we fear voicing our own concerns. Like I, I remember being at a point where I was dating a girl who, you know, wanted things that were just simply not in my budget. Um, and I never spoke up out of fear that she would leave. And I basically just credit carded the entire relationship. <laughs> well, <In there. laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> well, so after you both share your intentions, you move on to concerns. And we like to say that concerns are really the, the place for you to let the lizard brain, the amygdala come out and just really lay itself on the table. All your concerns, your big concerns, your little worries, your totally bizarre fears that you're like, I know logically this is never going to happen, but it's still in there. If it's still repeating in your brain, if it's still speaking to you in the middle of the night, then it needs to be voiced. And it's helpful to go into this conversation and just say, you know, this is a place not to argue about or be defensive about somebody else's worries. It's just really being vulnerable about what's going on in the back of your head. What are those thoughts that plague you? And once everybody shares their concerns, it's like, oh, God, like you feel that way too? Or, oh, wow, you know? Yeah, you don't need to worry about that. Why are you worried about right. that? Right. <laughs> and, and we do like to remind people like this isn't a place to argue points it's a pl you can ask clarifying questions. It's really an opportunity to listen and be clear as possible. I think one of the most powerful parts about the concerns, and it's about the whole conversation, but it shows up here in concerns especially, is that it's sort of this admission that we're all kind of nuts. We all have this like nutty internal monologue going on probably most of the time that makes zero sense. You know, like this is not, right. not really valuable. And it's just, you know, and it's just, you know, like, and so we, we train people or we, we encourage people to listen from a place of, you know, like a place of just listening, a place of curiosity, because you have this concern doesn't mean anything about me. doesn't mean I have to do anything. You may even be concerned that I'm going to get angry. You may be concerned that I'm going to break up with you if you do something. You may be concerned that I don't have the skills needed to accomplish this specific thing, right? That may feel like an attack in some way. But if we, I, I, I think if we start off with the idea that concerns aren't, concerns are worth getting out, we may have to address some of them at some point, but really right, what we're doing now is just getting them out and, and, and just sort of, you know, having a little bit of fun. Humans, man, we are, we are, you know, evolutionarily, adaptively, we are, um, we have a very, very strong negativity bias because missing something negative in your environment can, you know, kill you essentially, and, you know, whereas missing something positive in your environment it is, you know, it's disappointing, but it's not, it's not going to kill you. And so we have, our brains are actually trained to notice the stuff that's wrong. Our brains are, tra are trained to future trip and, and figure and, and imagine what might go wrong. Um, and this is the place just to sort of indulge that. And it can be actually kind of fun. And well, I think what we've found over the years of using it and teaching it is that when you express what the lizard brain is worried about, 
And then you have a very peaceful, just kind of, oh, reaction from people, then your nervous system calms down. Mm -hmm. The nervous system calms down and then you're able to be more creative in your thinking and you're, you're able to listen and learn better. So it, I think it's, it, I would love to dive into the science on this to, to a lot Srini more. Pillay we'll talk to Srini Pillay <laughs> again about this. But I think it actually benefits the person's nervous so system. So what happens when the response isn't, oh, uh, it's, you're right, you don't have enough money, or you're right, I do need these really expensive things. So we go back to the, the framework of this conversation is not to argue sure. points or win. This is an opportunity to really find out if we're in alignment, get all this stuff out on the table. And then like, is this a hell yes for both of us? Or have we found that, wow, there's too many points of contention and disagreement here. So this is a no, like we're not going to move forward with this or, oh, now we know where we need to work on things specifically together. So it clears a lot of stuff away and you get really focused on what needs help. It, it seems like the, the sort of the natural uh, segue from concerns because concerns seem like they just lead to what your boundaries are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they yeah. really do. Absolutely. And, and so, and boundaries can be, you know, maybe a couple different flavors, but one flavor could be to address a specific concern. So if the concern is that we're, you know, that we're going to blow our budget, we might, you know, this is not the real purpose of the boundary section. I'm going to get into that in a moment, but we could just say, let's have a boundary that we're going to have a budget check in every week, you know, just to kind of, you know, like, and it becomes the, the, the idea behind a boundary is it comes from a, there's a sort of a, a psychological, actually a legal framework is well known as a bright line. Um, and it's when it comes to habit change, I don't know if you ever quit smoking. I certainly have. It's way easier to say, I'm never going to smoke, um, than it is to say, I'm going to try to cut down because we don't, because the, the try to cut down is this vague space. Whereas I'm never going to smoke is a bright line. You know, when you crossed it, it's binary. And so the idea behind a, a boundary is that you want to create, you want to express things that are, that are binary for you. Um, and then when I do this in the, especially in the business environment, you know, like people just aren't trained to take care of themselves in the business environment. There's this underlying assumption that the job will always come first. Uh, you know, and if you if we have if we're under deadline and you know we got to work late, then everybody's staying and we got to work late. That kind of thing. Um, and in the world, I, I know you know you you know your name of their, your podcast, Unmistakable Creative. When you're doing creative work, that doesn't work, right? If I want people to be engaged and creative and their best self. I probably have to honor some of their boundaries, you know, like they're going to have to, you know, the more that if you've slept well, you're going to do better than if you haven't slept well, if you're exercised and you've eaten well, and you're not worried about your kids, you know, waiting for you at school because you got to go pick them up or something like that. So the boundary is really about self care. Um, and it's about what is it that you need, you need as a unique individual, as a unique human being, what do you need to be at your 100% best and show up at your best for this project at hand. Um, another part of that may be that, look, you know, and I see this in, in business all the time that where people are allocated to like five different teams or 20 different teams and a bunch of different projects. I want them to tell me, where does this project sit in the pecking order of your projects? Is this the most important project on your plate? Or if those other two projects suddenly need your time, which they likely will, will you, can we no longer count on you? And some people may come at the project with very different sets of boundaries. And this is maybe a place where we blow it apart and figure out that we're not a good match. Or it may be a place where we figure out that, look, this doesn't have to be fair. You know, somebody's young early in their career. They need this project to go really well because it's going to you know, do something really amazing for them. Somebody else might be later in their career and be more focused on their community or their family and be like, I just I go home at five to eat with my kids. You know, and so you can actually have and allow for varying degrees of effort input into the project once you understand each other's boundaries. But it's a, but this is a way of sort of making explicit what your boundaries are and making explicit that I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to understand your value, your, your boundaries. And I'm going to, as your teammate, because I want this team to go well, I'm going to now be committed to you getting to, to make you making sure you you can be at your best and you're, and you're able to hold your boundaries because holding our own boundaries can be really obviously challenging. Yeah. I've, I've actually discovered a couple of new boundaries recently, you know, as a solopreneur and I'm, I'm sure some of your listeners can empathize with this. You know, I had my online business manager. Um, she doesn't send me any 
emails that are negative anymore. I don't see any comments about my podcast or my books or my blogs. Nothing comes through the pipeline to me that's a negative critique. I'm like, you know what? I just don't need to see that anymore. I really don't. So she just heads it off at the pass for me. That is a boundary and it's really protective of my creative space. And it's been wonderful. Well, I think that makes, I think that takes us into the, the final piece of this, which is uh, dreams, which you call our highest hopes and aspirations. Uh, so how does that come out? I mean, do, and how have you guys seen it come out when, and when you've taken people through this process? I love this part. We love to end on a high note. It's about, okay, we've heard all the concerns. We know the why. We know the boundaries. And, you know, again, another caveat for this entire framework, you're not necessarily ordering off a menu, right? Not everybody gets everything they want. Maybe, maybe you all do. And that's fantastic. That's totally within the realm of possibility. But, you know, we're we're putting everything out there. So let's really dream big about what is the ultimate possibility, the ultimate vision that we have for this? And, you know, when we talk about, we use this framework for vacation planning all the time and we really go into, you know, I want to create moments with you. I want to spend time with the family and, and feel really nourished. And if it's a, a, a planning project, it'll be like, you know, we, we fill the program with our goal number of members and the people get so much out of it and they go on and they use the learning and the tools and they build their businesses. You know, you really just go there, you go to the vision so that you re-inspire yourself and it helps put all the other stuff you've just learned into perspective. I feel like all three, like intentions is more just sort of the, it's the entry into the conversation. Um, and it's, and it really does allow people to reflect on their values. And, and so it can, it can shine a light on some unexamined things would be things that people don't often, often don't examine, especially at work, right? Why are we doing this? Well, because we have to, no, that's not really true. Like, you know, I'm doing this because I don't want to get fired. Like maybe that's true. I don't know, but you know, but it's still there. There's an intention there. But the other three pieces, concerns, boundaries, and dreams, are all, to speak about them out loud, there's a taboo or a series of taboos around all of them. Like, don't complain. Don't be negative. I don't know if you read the Theranos book, but I think one of the things that, you know, like, this sort of, uh, Theranos is just a crazy, crazy story. But one of the things, you know, like, whenever anybody would disagree with the CEO, she would say, you know, you're not a team player and you're out, you know, you're just being negative and you're out. So, and so like concerns were just not okay to express. Mm-hmm. Like, and I, and while that's a sort of a crazy edge of it in, in that story, it's actually a, a very, very common thing in organizations. When, if someone says, Hey, are, are you, aren't you worried that we're not going to, you know, the boss will say, you got, you need to be a team player on this and, and almost shame people for expressing concerns. Likewise, when people express personal boundaries and that they are expressing self-care, there's taboos against that, especially we've discussed for women, can, especially can, for women and pay a big price for the uh, uh, an inordinately larger price for this in, in the business world. And then lastly, you know, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I, I was raised in a good waspy family, you know, where we weren't supposed to shine too bright and, uh, and we're supposed to sort of toe the line. And so dreaming big and imagining what, you know, all the things that might happen. One, you're not supposed to shine so bright. Don't get in, in, we're Southerners, so don't get too big for your britches, you know. Um, but two, there's that, what, what's that phrase from psychology where they talk about it? It's, it's sort of like a, um, it's a preemptive, like before you do something, you preemptively get bummed out about it going poorly mm-hmm. as a means of sort of protecting your ego. It's a means of self-protection. Because dreaming big can be really freaking scary. Like if my dream for this book, and I'm just going to speak it, if my dream for this book is that it be, that it does you know, become something of an icon, the way the four agreements, you know, is sort of an icon, um, or the way some of Brene Brown's work is sort of icon in the self-development world. If this becomes that kind of iconic process and people, you know, like, like, and then, and I get in, you know, you're like Bob Gower, creator of, you know, like that I get that, you know, like that is a dream that I have. And even speaking it now, I actually feel my palms sweating a little bit, you know, like, because, it's too big. It's, it's something we're not supposed to do, but when you do it warm, you know, with somebody else, somebody hearing it with you and dreaming it with you, I think it can be really, really generative. And I always say, or what I do say now is I would rather aim much too high and miss and be really ambitious 
than to aim moderately and hit the target. Wow. The thing that I am getting, the sense that I get from uh, listening to you guys talk about this is that this is not sort of a, a checklist of things to do, but rather it's a practice and that it's fluid. Yes. Thank you so much. That's such a great articulation. That's exactly it. Yeah. And it's sort of, and we always say that this is like, this is sort of the scales version of it. You know, the way we describe it is like you have, you know, like go through it and, you know, procedurally and, you know, keep time and have a facilitator and all those things. Um, and, you know, we've, you know, created all the stuff to kind of help you do that. But what we really hope is that this sort of bleeds into your life, the way it's bled into our life. Like we don't actually very often say we're starting the process and we're stopping the process. We'll just sort of dip into and out of it. Like we're discussing buying property now. And so, you know, like as we discuss that, it'd be like, hey, what do you what do you dream for? You know, what, what's your dream house? Tell me more about your dream house. Tell me right. more about your dream home. You know? So I have one last question for you guys, uh, which is how we finish all of our interviews with the unmistakable creative. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Wow. I don't know. I'm just going to go on. I'm going to say it flaws. You know, like the more I, I work with a lot of, uh, I, I, I'm an independent consultant now, but I tend, I, I build teams or I work with partners when I need to, and when I, you know, to, to go after certain opportunities and I work with people, I want to work with people who are unique and work with people who are unmistakable and every single person I know who fits that category brings along with them some blind spot, some flaw, some quirk, uh, and, the, the, and, and so I don't want people to be homogenous around me. I want people to be delightful and fresh and interesting. I still want them to be good hearted. You know, like there's certain there's certain flaws I'm not going to put up with or not or, or won't work with me personally. But I really do think um, a friend of mine said this years ago. It's like we, we love each other for, you know, our foibles and not our perfections. And I, and I think that's really absolutely true. I'm just going to say ditto. That was so good. How can I improve on that one? <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, uh, I can't thank you guys for, for taking the time to join us and share your story and insights with our, our listeners. Where can people find out uh, more about everything that you guys are up to and, and uh, all, all this information that you've just shared with us? Great. So it's really simple. We have a website up called gettingtohellyes.com. Uh, and there it's a good clearinghouse. The book is also up. Uh, we offer the book for free, by the way, on the website. You just kind of click and download. We don't even ask for your email address. So if you just want to get the PDF of the book, go to the website. You can grab it. Uh, the book is also up on Amazon right now. It's in, uh, I don't know when this will go live. It'll go on sale. It's on pre-order now and it goes on sale officially on the 29th of September, uh, and for print and, and for ebook. Uh, and then we also offer a bunch of extras on the website too. So, uh, a facilitation guide, a series of slides you can use, uh, and, and also a cheat sheet that you can use in order to walk you through the, the conversation as you have it. Awesome. And for everybody listening, we'll wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared.